We're here in Big Iron Garage with Ray Everham. We're gonna learn about some IROC cars and IROC history. One of my first jobs was at IROC in the early 80s. I was driving modified, so I went to work there. Now, IROC is the International Race of Champions. It was started by Roger Penske, Jay Signori, Mike Phelps, uh, did the TV part. A guy named Les Richter, who was you know, NFL Hall of Famer. And they started with Porsches in 1973, but they only ran a few races and the Porsches were expensive. They're really expensive now. The most valuable IROC cars you can get, those things are two and a half, three and a half million dollars if you can get them. Wow. <laughs> then they switched to Camaros in 1974. So in 74 to 76, I believe, and again, it could be wrong. But they ran these and they were basically Camaro bodies they got from Chevrolet. They called bodies in white and they had stock Camaro snouts and things on them. They sent them down to Banjo Matthews and he put roll cages in them, worked on a little bit of the suspension, but then they were sent back to Penske Racing, and Penske Racing's guys that built all the Trans Am cars from Mark Donahue and those guys actually finished these cars and ran them. So they ran these 74, five, and six. This particular car, really cool car. Um, never won an IROC race, but it's been in a lot of different pictures. Brian Redman drove it, James Hunt drove it, you know, uh, I think A.J. Foyt drove it. So, it, you know, it's got some good history and it. it's really pretty, pretty original. So it's, it's a, a great car to have in our collection. Cars were running big ovals and one of the drivers, Richard Petty, said to the IROC guys, hey, look, if we're going to be running these speeds, you got to have more of a race car. So then they went to these cars and this car is a little bit of rough shape, but 1977 to 1980, they went to Banjo Matthews, the car builder for, you know, he built at that time, I guess Banjo probably built 80% of the, the NASCAR stock cars. He took over really after the Holman Moody um, people stepped aside and they built these cars. That's a 110 inch wheelbase, regular NASCAR stock car chassis and they ran these. These were to me the most popular ones. These are the cars I love. This is what, what I call the generation two IROC Camaro. They ran these from 77 to 80 and some of the greatest drivers in the world ran these things. Again, it's my favorite type car. I, I happen to have, uh, I've got one, two, three, four of these. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they're just, you know, from you name it and they've driven them. And I mean, from Formula One champions like, like Nicky Lauda and you know, James Hunt, you know, Derek Bell and people like that, all the way up to the Foyt and the Uncers and the Andretti's. So that, again, that's my favorite part of the series. But again, I never got to work on those because it just, you know, wasn't, wasn't working for them. And this particular car, we've uh, saved it, done a lot of uh, documentation on it. The cool part about this car, is not only was it driven by uh, Nicky Lauda in IROC competition, it was then sold to the Cook Woods Racing Team in California, and it actually won a Trans Am race at Laguna Seca with George Fulmer driving it. So it's got IROC wins and Trans Am, Trans Am wins. So it's a cool car. We're gonna uh, totally restore this one and, and make it some kind of a hybrid between its Trans Am life and its IROC life. This is an Avenger, but it actually started life as one of the Camaros that I was involved in building in 1983 and 1984. So after a big wreck at Atlanta in 1980, and you can see, you know, they just tore up a bunch of cars at Atlanta in 1980, IROC took a, a three-year hiatus and they brought it back. We went down to Banjo Matthews again and had him build these cars, which started life as the, what I call the generation three IROC. Camaros. They were full Banjo Matthews chassis. This is where the IROC Z and all that came from. Now, the hard part about finding an IROC Z <clears throat> is the only one that I know that exists in original condition is the one that Dale Earnhardt had, and that's one of the cars that I built. The IROC Camaros then became the Dodge Daytonas, which became the Dodge Avengers. Uh -huh. So there's Avengers around, but they're really the Camaros that had the bodies changed on them. And this car has an incredible list of drivers. It was one of the practice cars. Just about everybody that ran IROC from 84 on up to uh, when they went to the Firebirds had driven you know, or, or at this car at one point. These cars were always interesting to me because they had Dodge engines in them. And at this time there was no Dodge engines in Cup. Um, you know, again, I don't know a lot about what they used there, what, which package it was, but these were 340. They were nothing like what we ran in the cup cars uh, for Dodge. I think they were kind of based on what they were running in the truck series at that time. But, you know, what's neat about this is IROC, the guys at IROC evolved into their uh, own engine shop. So I believe that these were built, uh, these engines were built by the guys at IROC in partnership with a local racer in New Jersey named John Blewett. 
Kerr, and I think his company was called Flowtech at that time, and they worked together as a partnership uh, to build these engines. So, you know, again, pretty neat deal. Uh, didn't make a lot of horsepower. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, 550 or, or so, but still, cars were capable of running about mid-180s at Daytona, Talladega. Did these things have anything to do with Dodge's increased interest in getting back into that, which eventually led to you being the, the Dodge guy? Ah, uh, you know, I can't answer that because I don't know what happened behind the scenes, but, you know, I, you know, Dodge did these, the IROC, they did the truck series and then came into the Cup series, so I'm sure that they saw some increase in sales for the, for the IROC program, which so did Chevrolet, so did Pontiac, so did Porsche. Most of the manufacturers that have been with IROC have seen an increase in sales. What's really cool about it, it was converted to a two-seater, used as a Marlboro driving school, and I got it back, recognized it, because some of the cars, some of the parts and pieces that I built in 1984 are still on this car, so it's <laughs> cool, it's cool to own it. I'd love to find, a, I'd love to find another uh, one of these, I, because in my collection right now, what I'm missing is an IROC Camaro and the IROC Daytona, okay? The problem is, they were all the same cars, so, finding them i've got to find two of them uh, so it, it, it it's neat i was lucky enough to be able to locate a about 90 percent of one of the original camaro bodies so we plan on making molds off and making some newer or repairing those pieces so that if we can find more avengers that were camaros we can also do those over cars that are really complete i've been using them as templates to make the parts and pieces hopefully to help other people restore these things so soon minus a couple of pieces you know because the roof and the doors on those cars were stock tomorrow right now i'm looking for a, a hood and a couple of small pieces for the 84 to 89 uh, or 90 camaros and uh, and we'll have enough to make a complete body after they switched from Dodge, they went back to General Motors, the Firebirds. These cars were all built for them by Mike Laughlin. Banjo Matthews had passed away at that time, and they ran them up until the day of the last IROC race. Uh, this car is, is decaled up as it ran in the last race with, with Ryan Newman. Uh, it, these things, I think, were really nice, but unfortunately, you can see they started to become more and more real race car. They became very aerodynamic, and all of the things that take away good racing, uh, I, I think, started to, to hurt. And at this time, you know, big sponsorship was in. The, the owners really didn't want to have their drivers involved uh, because they didn't want them, you know, take time away from their own their own stuff. The sponsor conflict started to happen. Manufacturer st conflict started to happen. IndyCar was growing. Stock cars were growing. And it kind of hurt the IROC series. It's a shame. When you look back at the history of the IROC series, I think that it, it's time for that to, to maybe come back in, in some way because a lot of these vehicles, there's just not cars out there right now that so many great drivers drove. And not only great drivers, I've got a little jewel hidden over here under the plastic. I'll tell you a story about this car here. This car is, uh, it's, it was IROC number 15, the last time it raced at Riverside, California. Darrell Walter won the race with it. It was a practice car for a while, but this car was used in a promotion at Sears Point raceway and they brought in some movie stars to drive it so that car not only was driven by the greatest drivers in the world race drivers it was driven on the same day by paul newman gene hackman clint eastwood james brolin and then uh bob bonderon so it really cool history i've got all the lap times from those guys and i'm going to tell you uh gene hackman and paul newman were wheelmen they they went pretty quick in that car compared to some of our the professional drivers so you know in a nutshell i think that this is a special year with the 50th anniversary of IROC coming up there's so many stories to be told throughout that uh many of the guys that drove in that series the early series especially are still around jay signori the man that basically was the mastermind behind putting all, all the cars together uh speak to him regularly and, and it, it it to me it, it's it's it obviously it's its own little cult thing but when you look at the talent the drivers the the things that went in that iraq in there you know they ran from uh, i think um 1973 to about 2000 was it six, six, I, think uh, it was six. Uh, I think was the last race so there's many different stories and historical moments from some of the greatest drivers in the world i just think it's a great story and each one of these cars has got its own story you know it did uh, you know you can see all the stuff I know I've gotten hidden all over the place, and I'm sorry again for the, the memorabilia sitting around here. 
this car again i rock car this was a some of it started life as a as a silver number nine and it got flipped over by al holbert and then they put new cage and parts and then they said it was a upgraded number nine and then tom sneva smashed it into the guardrail at at riverside and they fixed it again and as the series got passed around this thing ended up it ran a trans am race here at charlotte and then it got made into a short track car in ohio then somehow it ended up in a dirt track in alaska and then <laughs> you know so now now it's back here and you know again if these things could tell stories it, it would you know be incredible got another one in the back that we're restoring to take to charlotte and if you want to see that one that's the car you can probably get some really nice close-up shots and i can talk you through that a little bit if you want to see it yeah i, got I can't get over that nikki lauda drove this car yeah. that is so cool yeah nikki lauda drove that one we've got we've got a picture of uh of the car decaled up uh, and uh, at Riverside with Lauda on the side of it. That's so cool. Yeah. That's an awesome car to have. Yeah. <laughs> you know, again, when you look at Lauda and, and Hunt and, you know, the, and, and some of the guys that came over to do that, you know, really, really pretty amazing. What I'm curious about is how they went from kind of like the actual Camaro with a cage in it to the stock car chassis with a Camaro body on it. Um, well, when you, you think about Roger Penske's organization at that time was largely sports car oriented. You know, they, they did Trans Am and they did Can Am and, and IndyCar and, and he dabbled in stock cars. But, but, you know, again, just getting into that. So th they just assumed, hey, you know, we'll build a car the way we build them. But then they took them to Daytona. Right. And you had guys like Richard Petty and, and A.J. Foyd and Bobby Allison say, hey, these things aren't really designed for here. And if we're going to run these cars at these speeds, you need to look at this. So it was just evolution. You know, again, they evolved from the Porsches to, to this generation Camaro, to that generation Camaro, to this Camaro, Daytona Avenger, and then <laughs> finally to the Firebirds. So, uh, you know, my goal is to have all of them. I don't really believe that I'm ever going to afford a, a, a Porsche. Well, maybe we'll build a replica, but uh, you know, the, there were a limited number of Porsches and only a limited number of true IROC cars cars that competed in the IROC series it, you know there's only a limited number that exist people have to be pretty wealthy to own one of those so when these cars were finished out were they sold by Penske to just whoever wanted yeah, one and this ended up in some, Trans Am you know, some of them were you know there some went, went into private you know most of the cars as they got sold were used for other race series you know this including the porsches like they got sold for next to nothing you know and you know the, these things again you know next to the really nothing uh, nobody wanted them um so they, they were being sold at really really fair prices like many of the old vintage sports cars you know that stuff was given away you look at the at the daytona coupes that that ran Le Mans, right you know the the the, the shelby daytonas they were going to push those things off the boat into the ocean right they just didn't it, it wasn't worth bringing them home and now they're worth millions and hopefully you know these irock cars start to get some of the respect that they deserve let's check out that other one back there i want to yeah. see some technical stuff sure so this is a car that we're getting ready we're going to start to display that this year this is uh was they called irock number four it was a light blue car ran again the whole series from 77 to 80. Uh, Peter Gregg, the road racer, won Riverside in this car, but been driven by tons of people. Like, Where'd you find this car? What kind of condition uh, was it in when you, I when you got it? I keep an eye on it. I keep an eye on it and when they pop up. You know, I'm always searching for them. Bob Sharp actually had bought this car as part of a collection that he bought, so I bought it from Bob Sharp. Huh. And but, you know, when I say Bob Sharp, I'm an obviously you know, well-known in, in the road racing world um, through several of the things that he did. And it was actually restored by the guys at IROC through the 80s. It was dropped off there, restored. Um, we've replaced the engine in it. The cars had originally had Traco engines in them. You know, this is not a complete Traco uh, engine, but they were steel heads and, and, uh, and whatnot, again, on these cars. So, you know, we're trying to make this car runnable. I want to take it to the racetrack and use it for some vintage race events. But again, it, this car is one of the most original ones because it was stored uh, and restored by, by IROC. And when you look at some of the seats and different things, that, you know, these were seats and pieces that we actually made while I was at IROC. Uh, you know, inside this car, it, it is, it, again, being done over by Jay Signori and the IROC group, it's very, very original. It's a car that was crashed 
I think it was crashed in that big crash at uh, 1980. Um, I'm not sure who was driving it, maybe one of the Whittington brothers. But as I said, the fact that it was one of the original cars and it was restored by the guys at IROC make it really valuable to me. And then Peter Gregg, who was one of the greatest road racers in America ever, actually won a race in this car. So is this one of the bodies in white or is it a banjo chassis? No, this is a banjo chassis. So the, the other 74, 74 through 76, I guess, are the bodies in white. Then the banjo cars were this generation Camaro because again, you know, the, they changed the Camaro body, I believe, in 77 to a different body. This, this is one of the newer bodies. These cars were steel roof, steel doors, steel quarter panels. Everything else is fiberglass. And they ran these again, 77, 8, 9, and, and 80. It's really cool because the old Hearst Earhart brakes and things like that are, are still on the cars. These cars didn't have power steering, which was really cool. And even when we built the cars originally in 1984, they didn't have power steering. We later put power steering on them, but they were they were pretty difficult to drive without power steering. You know, didn't have a lot of downforce, but you know, again, fairly heavy cars. Did the racing change when they went from the, you know, Camaro with a cage into the banjo chassis? Like, did the NASCAR guys start to do better when uh, they did that? Did the other guys complain? I don't know that the NASCAR guys did better probably on the road courses so uh, you know at, at that time they, they the race cars evolved um the irock races at daytona talladega and places like that were always pretty good right because cars were big and bulky and i think what really started to um make the the stock car guys the nascar guys shine is they started to run more old you know where it started out predominantly a road course series it, it ended up predominantly Oaths, and that gave the stock car guys an advantage. Plus, even on the road courses, the NASCAR guys were just becoming better and better road racers. I started at IROC in uh, December of 1983. So my, my era, I worked at IROC from 83 to 89, which was all Camaros, the IROC Z. Um, I didn't work on the Daytonas or the Avengers. These cars were the series before me. They were 77, uh, 77 to 80, but there were several of these still it, you know at Penske Racing when I went there so um, even though I didn't work on them to race I worked on them we took parts off of them we moved them around we we copied a lot of stuff off of them so they were there I'm somewhat familiar with these cars but I did not work on them during the race That's something that very different with these cars most fuel cells NASCAR fuel cells were at that time 22 gallons now they're 18 I rock because they ran 100 miles with no pit stops we're always 30 gallon fuel cells so 30 to 33 gallons of fuel in these cars so really really tail heavy at the start of a race and then big change uh, as they would go on how did you guys make sure they were all the same what was that like actually in the shop trying to sort that out well the common sense was a lot of it you know we didn't have the tools they have today like lasers and the way they measure things and, and all that you know we used templates and 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 measurements and and you know scales all of those things you know we would we would build a prototype car and then at that time you got to remember in the early 80s we just did not have we didn't have coordinate measure machines and laser scanners and you know we rapid prototyping or cnc's or any of that stuff to build them with so built them by hand and we did it the old-fashioned way you know using common sense and tape measures and dial calipers and you know making everything as the as best as we could and I, I feel like for the for the tools we had versus what i know now about aerodynamics and and you know chassis dynos and all those things we did a pretty darn good job or as close as those cars were that always fascinated me like if you okay maybe this engine makes five more horsepower and this chassis has been fixed a couple times was there any kind of like moving things around or is it like oh this is a brand new car does it not get the oh no the, you, uh, you're 100 right but the, what we had you know at, no two carburetors were the same. No two sets of tires are the same, right? Mm -hmm. So we would move things around to make it an average. Yeah. And that would, you know, would make the racing better. And there were times at super speedways or places like that, you know, we'd raise or lower the spoiler, at, you know, add a little drag, take a little drag away. And, you know, that would give a car a certain advantage in a certain place, but not everywhere. And, you know, in the end, it was about the race. You know, IROC was a show. It was a TV show. So the whole deal about making up for passing was, you know, the cars and the drivers would be would be different to create passing opportunities. So in the end, we could get the cars to run the same lap speed within a tenth of a second at a lot of places we went to. But how we did that 
sometimes was just was mixing and matching the best parts and, and pieces. That's interesting to me. Yeah. Would you like take the cars all out individually Absolutely, prior to that? 100%. You know, it, it was three, we'd get to a show three days, four days ahead of time, and Dave Marcus and George Fulmer, you know, part of my job was I would shake all the cars down to make sure they were good mechanically and, and that everything was ready to go. And then Dave Marcus and George Fulmer would do the final adjustments and, and match the lap times. So, you know, it, it, that was a three day process. And sometimes we'd take a carburetor off this car or we'd take an engine out of that car. Or we'd do whatever we had to do to get the lap times to be the same. Did you ever find anything like at Daytona or Talladega where certain cars would run within a tenth of the same lap time alone, but then you put them in a pack and this one's just way better than the other ones for some weird reason? Uh, you know, we never, you know, I really felt confident that when we, by the time we got to, uh, to Daytona, Talladega, our, our stuff was pretty good. And a lot of times, you know, be, because these, these cars were so, you know, they create such a hole in the air, they drafted really good. So if a guy was a good drafter, it, it would equal itself out. The only time somebody get way behind is that they messed up and lost the draft. Interesting. So the, the unaerodynamicness of these things kind of was part of the equalization in itself because you didn't have the little ticky tacky things that would make some guy's car way worse than someone else's or something like that it's, you're exactly right because they 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 weren't that sensitive they, they were they were just they, they they weren't that great aerodynamically they weren't they weren't some super aerodynamic piece so they weren't sensitive to little things and you know to me as we've developed and evolution of the race cars come on that everything's become about aerodynamics and it makes the cars extremely sensitive you know if you put you, you take a, a car out there that relies on mechanical grip and horsepower and driver ability and whatnot it makes for a better show and as i said i rock was a show it was a tv show it was driver against driver it wasn't supposed to be about the car did you ever catch anybody trying to like do something to their car when nobody was looking like you know Put air pressure time. down things all like that time to talk try and talk guys into it you know it was fun to watch you know it, it, you know there's a these cars at one time had a uh, uh an electric rev chip on them and, and there's a story going back to they believe bobby allison or i'm sorry bobby unser had you know an alligator clip he could bypass the thing so <laughs> you know urban legends but you know dale earnhardt and people like that were always checking heights dale would Dale would make a mark on his fire suit to see how low, you know, how his spoiler was up, or try and figure out how low his front air dam was was up and down. And then with the radial tire, they were always trying to get the guys to let a little air out of them. So it was a fun game. Huh. I always wondered about that. You know, you hear stories like that of every other form of racing, and I think if, if all cars are equal, they're probably, you know, like trying to let well, air we, pressure out with their toe or something. We tried not to let them touch them <laughs> for that reason. Did anybody ever get away with it that you found uh, out after well, the fact? Obviously, I don't think that anybody did, but I mean, I wouldn't know if they did, right? <laughs> you know, so if they got away with it, you know, because we, didn't, I never really caught, I never caught any drivers messing with the car when they weren't supposed to. Huh. You know, there was plenty of drivers that tried to talk us into doing something for them, but <laughs> if I had one more really cool thing to do in my life, I'd love to bring IROC back. That'll be a sound bite for sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to see that. So in your perfect world, if you were to bring IROC back, would you do it with a current production car or would you do it with a vintage body like the Camaro? Uh, I would probably do it with a current car, much like when I designed the SRX series, I did that with IROC really in mind. So I think an IROC car would be something that looks that its own. It would not be a Chevy, a Ford, or a Dodge because that way you could get drivers again i would use a lot of the things that i learned from starting uh, uh srx but i think that like you know iraq or like srx now that i've done it again i think i can do it better if i uh, had a shot to do it again hmm. yeah that makes sense a lot of guys have the like they can't be seen around a ford if they're a chevy guy and it's that just, kind of stuff some of the you know you, you look at all of the things i think that hurt iraq and you take those away and all the things that you really felt made iraq good and you keep those would you want to see iraq come back because i would and i know for a fact ray and other guys are going to read the comments on this video so if you want to see it come back speak up about it down there things like this actually make a difference everything starts with one voice to two it's exponential you would be amazed how much power you actually have you think oh i'm just one person i can't do anything no much bigger than that if you don't speak up you'll never get what you want
before I go on a rant about the state of the world right now. If you like these kind of racing history videos, you poke that subscribe button down there. It just shows you when we post a new one. It doesn't cost anything. I gotta explain that sometimes because, you know, not everybody knows that. If you support the documentation of racing history, go watch our other videos. It helps the channel grow. You poke the thumbs up button, that helps the channel grow. You leave comments, helps it grow. And that's the best thing we can do. And if you'd like to go beyond that, you can check out stapletonautoworks.com and find the shirts and hats that we wear. If we're wearing in that video, I've got different ones on now because that's what it is. This one has boom tubes on it. Anyway, we're glad you're here. It's awesome knowing that there's so many people that have the same interests that we do. So we appreciate you.